Praise God. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, before we get to reading in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to go to Matthew 5 and we're going to read verse 1, uh, start in verse 1, and we'll read through a little bit here. Uh, many scholars and commentators believe that, the, that Matthew is a gospel that's written specifically related to Jesus as king. Uh, because it talks about the lineage of Jesus and how when you trace Jesus' lineage in Matthew, it comes through Solomon, which was the, the rightful heir to the throne. And it connects us also, obviously, to David because David was the rightful heir and he is actually the type of Jesus. Amen. And so in those passages that I'm about to read to you, these verses speak specifically. It's like the king is addressing his citizens, if you will. And so let's go ahead and, and take a look at how Jesus addresses his citizens whenever he's preaching um, on the uh, on the mountain and he's preaching these uh, beatitudes. Right. So it says here in, in chapter five, verse one. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, where will, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, O oh Lord God. Your word is what sets us apart, O oh Lord God, from the world. It's your word that teaches us your character. It's your word, Lord, that if we'll put it in our spirit, man, it'll transform our lives, Lord God, because it teaches us who you are and it teaches us how, Lord God, to walk with you, Lord. And so we pray tonight, I pray, Lord, that sweet spirit of God, you would be the preacher in that you would be the teacher because the people need to hear what you would have to say, oh Lord. We no longer, we don't have time, Lord, to listen to the words of a man, Lord. Time is getting short, Lord God. The days are growing dark, Lord, and we need you to speak to us. We need you to reveal your heart to us, Lord God, so that we can walk right before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I'm not going to preach this whole passage of scripture, but I did want to point out a couple of things. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he went into blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Poor in spirit. You know. Poor in spirit, uh, the person that's poor in spirit is actually powerful in spirit because if he's poor in spirit, he understands the, the source uh, and the result of his power because he understands that it's Jesus and so therefore he's, he's not prideful whenever the Lord begins to work in him and begins to work through him. That's why whenever she began to sing that part right there and I knew that I was thinking about this when I was writing my notes. It's not about me. It's about you. It was really ministering to my spirit. But if that man of God, if that woman of God starts to get confused because I'm just saying she has a beautiful voice or he thinks he 
He's some kind of a preacher or, or he, somebody operates in a certain kind of anointing and he starts to get confused and he starts to think that he was the cream of the cop crop and, and he, he was the darling of heaven and that, and that it was because of who he was and how he handled his business that the Lord just reached down and grabbed a hold of him. He'll start to get confused and, and if he's not careful, he'll start to move towards a position where he will start to take a little bit of the glory of the Lord that belongs to him and he'll try to put some of that on himself. You know, the word pauper is actually used in this word, poor in spirit. You know, a pauper is a, a poor person, he's so poor that he's a beggar. You know, people don't want to think that way, but I didn't write this book. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit wrote this book and the word pauper is in the word poor whenever you look up the, uh, the Greek definition and a pauper again is a beggar and, and you know w do we have to be beggars upon the earth absolutely not I believe that God is a blessing God I believe he's a powerful God but we're talking about the spirit right now we're talking about the spirit right now and if we don't come to the conclusion in our heart and in our life that we in and of ourselves have nothing to offer the Lord if the Lord had not shown up whenever he showed up and saved me Lord only knows where I would be I can't speak for your story I love your stories when I get to hear them but I know that you have to have a story similar to mine in that God showed up at some point in time and he revealed his truth to you and he ministered his life to you and he poured his goodness on the inside of you and he transformed your life hallelujah and guess what we need to hold on to the truth that without him we are nothing and in him we have everything that we need hallelujah to live on this earth and to give him glory yes. praise God do you think it's possible that when we don't get recognized that sometimes our flesh wants to get recognized and that the, is it possible when that happens that the enemy could use that as an opportunity to cause strife, cause division, yes. cause yes. confusion. Yes. And, and then if that's possible, I wonder who should I expect to be the author of that confusion? Because I know the word of God says that God is not the author of confusion. He doesn't cause confusion and chaos, right? And so we, we need to be aware of the fact that just even though we love the Lord like we do, and I'm very grateful. I'm getting more and more grateful for the people in this church every day that goes by every service that we have when you can see the heart of people's worship. And I'm sincere in that. And then to know that we have people in this church that have a desire to go outside the walls of this church and to minister to people, praise God. I mean, I keep saying it, but we got people praying for people in Walmart. We got, we got people praying for people wherever they work. We, we have people ready to go knock on doors. We're going to the nursing home. We're going to the prisons. I went to the jail again today. Hallelujah. I, I just want to tell somebody the good news about Jesus. And the other day, I think it was Monday, I was in the, I was in one of the clinics and all of a sudden, I, I don't know even know what opened up the door. She, I don't, she, she said something and I said, man, it's, it's dark out there. She said, it's scared. And so I started talking to her about the gospel and before you know it, I just, I got on the pearl of great price. And, and she, I don't even think that she was a believer, but I got on the pearl of great price. And I, and I started to say that people are looking and they're searching and they're wandering around and they're looking for something. And there's, there's a piece that's missing. And, and there was a merchant and he was a pearl merchant. And he, he sailed the seas all over and he was looking for this goodly pearl. It was this one pearl that he knew if he found that pearl, that he would have found exactly what he was looking for. And when he found that pearl, he sold everything. He shut the whole thing down and he bought that one pearl. That one pearl was what he was looking for. And that's the gospel. That's Jesus. People are searching in this world right now. And I'm telling you right now, church, you, I don't have to convince you of it because you have to see what I'm seeing, that the world is in chaos and people are in the midst of confusion. And there's so many thoughts out there and so many ideas. And the one thing that they need the most, they're missing. And we really do have to let the Holy Spirit do a work in our hearts and in our lives, amen, for us to be meek, for us to be humble, amen. The word, the word meek really means humble power. You know, that's a beautiful thing. Paul said this, or Jesus told Paul this, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Many times we attempt in our own strength to accomplish the things of God. And if we would just learn to realize that what we need to do is be poor in spirit and to be meek and to lower ourselves and to humble ourselves under the hand of God. And if we would do that and have a heart of repentance, right? Come to the Lord. Get clean with the Lord and to say, Lord, I have failed you. I've gone against you or wherever I am. Or, I'm not, or I've been complacent in my walk or what, whatever it is. And, and to come to the Lord and to let him have his way with us. There's great power in that. When we surrender to the Lord. When we learn how to walk in humility. Instead of being, you know, puffed up and prideful. The Lord said it himself. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Yes. And to lay his life down as many. Yeah, I, I tell this story a lot, but I, I, I really... Can't hardly really get it out of my heart, my mind. Whenever they came to get him in the garden of Gethsemane, he 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 said he could sense him. You know, he, Jesus was operating in some serious gifts, amen. And he says, and, and I mean, this is the way I took it out of the scripture. I don't even think that he turned it. He's like, so whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. And you know what's so beautiful? Whenever you start digging into the original language a little bit. Uh, I learned this one thing when I took my little one Greek class is that it, it, it is, I'm not going to get fancy and write it for you, but the word ego is actually a Greek word. Okay. And ego, E-M-I means I am. So in the translations, they put I am he. And if you'll look at your King James, they have he in italics. The translators added that because they thought they were helping us. But in reality, it's, what it says is I am. And so whenever he turned and he said, I am they, they, they bit the dust. They fell down on their face. The power of God knocked them down. And at some point, Jesus also said, did you not know that I can call legions of angels from my father? But yet at the same time, with all of that power that was resident on the inside of him, right? He ends up letting them bind him and take him to the cross because he knew that that was the father's will. It's an amazing thing to think that we so oftentimes fight for our own position. And I know y'all know what I'm talking about because it happens to all of us. When we feel like we've been offended, when, and I'm not saying that you let people walk over you. That's between you and the Holy Spirit in your individual lives and in your daily circumstances. But I'm telling you right now, I was in the jail today and this guy, I want some, he said he wants some private time with me. I'm like, that's going to be hard to accomplish. But so he starts telling me a story and he felt like he had been treated wrongly. And I said, well, if whatever happened, if you're saying what happened, happened, then I do believe you. I agree. You've been treated wrongly. And I feel like what you need to do is you need to go ahead and you need to send, you know, you can send your grievance. But, but after that, dude, you need to let it go. You need to put it in the hands of the Lord and you need to let it go. At least that's how I see it. Because if not, you're going to hold on to it. And if it's not working the way you want it to work, it's going to start to build in you. and It's going to cause bitterness to eat away at you like a canker. And, you, and none of us can afford that to happen. And many times that's what happens when things don't go the way we want them to, when we, when we expect them to be changed and they don't change the way we want them to, then, then the enemy uses that as a foothold and he comes in and he begins to drive and he causes bitterness. And listen, bitterness will mess you up. Bitterness will mess up your walk with the Lord. The Lord said he came to lay his life down. His purpose was to glorify the, the Father, to do the will of God. Amen. Praise God. He was found in the appearance of man. He humbled himself for the point of obedience. You know, I can't help but think about the obedience of Jesus. I mean, I know, it, I know it's kind of like, y'all probably don't think this way, but it's like, what in the world would this place be had, you know, had Jesus somehow not been obedient? I get it. I, I know it. But it's like, can you imagine the darkness? I mean, just think of your own life. If the Lord, yeah. even if Jesus had not come to the earth yet, do you realize how dark it was pre-flood? Do you realize how dark it was at the time of the Tower of Babel? If, if you read your Bible and you read between the lines, it was, it was bad. It, it was really dark during the time of the kings. The way Israel was acting, it was, it was bad. There's a lot of darkness. Now, America's bad. Just think if we didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit upon this earth. Just think if we didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit living in the midst of our hearts and in our lives. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it'd be bad, 
right? But he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. For this reason, God has highly exalted him. Praise God. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name. That, that's the beauty of what Jesus has done. You see, God the Father could trust him and because he was faithful to the will of the Father. Amen. And many times in our own lives, we're over, we, we want to be promoted. You know, I mean, promotion is a good thing. The word of God says promotion comes from the Lord. But sometimes we want to be promoted, but we're not really doing what we should have been doing to be faithful in the house of God and the things of God. But not only that, at the workplace, because I've said this many times, our work ethic is a reflection of our walk with God. Yeah, OK, if we're over here preaching Jesus, but we're but we're a hindrance in the workplace, that's not a good witness. People are, you know, and our demeanor also matters. Poor in spirit, meek and humble, right? Because if we're if we're prideful and we're treating, oh, this is okay. It's okay. This is real world stuff right here, it's man. Okay. But if we're if we're acting prideful and we're and we're arrogant and we're cutting and we're rude and we're brash, Lord help us. Lord help me, the preacher. I don't want to be that way. I'm not going to do it. Praise God, Lord help. Sometimes I come across that way, but I don't feel like I'm that way in my heart. I'm just, you know, trying to, you know, you got to find the difference between being a blunt communicator. I think I go overboard, but let me not get on me right now. Amen. Some people are just like it. They just tell you. They just tell you like it is. And I'm over here, like, trying to, like, you know, please forgive me for what I'm about to say. I don't want you to take it the wrong way. You know, but it is good to try to be humble. Especially one of the things that I've learned in life, and this is actually good right here, so I'll go ahead and release this for you. One of the things that I learned in life is that not too many people like correction. Even people that know it's good for them. Even people like us that have read the scripture, right? Yeah. And we know that correction is a good thing. And it's a, the proverb would tell you that the man that receives instruction, it's a good thing for a man or a woman that receives instruction. But boy, try to dole it out. Huh? I can remember one time I had one of my bosses, like, you know, he was over there pumping me up, telling me about how productive I was and all this. And then about a week later, somebody said something about, he's like, Matt, this is what I need you. And I said, I don't think that's going to work for me, boss. And he was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, wait, that wasn't the response I expected. And boy, something rose up on the inside of me. Long story short, three days later, the whole thing was rectified. He kind of like apologized. But the Holy Spirit said, no, that whole thing happened because I'm trying to deal with you. You've always had a problem with correction. You, you know, and you need to let me deal with you. You need to understand that correction is a good thing. And if you learn how to surrender and humble yourself, th then things will go a whole lot better for you. Amen. So anyway, I hope you can use that. One day, we're going to receive glory. Though. I know we've been talking about that a lot lately. We will one day be like he is. In other words, we're going to have a glorified body. Amen. And it's his kingdom. You know, it's interesting that she started singing that. I, I put it in my notes. It's his kingdom, not mine. It's his glory, not mine. It's his work, not mine. Why would I try to gain glory now when even then it won't be my own? He's wanting us to practice exalting him now. Yeah. I believe that with all of my heart, church. Listen, if I could cast vision, you know, the pastors say that sometimes. I'm like, but the Lord already gave his vision. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples of all men, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. But, but if I could cast a little vision of what the Lord told me for our church, and I believe that this is really for every church, and I believe that many pastors have a revelation of it, but I'm so excited because I feel like we're really moving into a place where we're starting to do that. What is that? To Exalt the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit said, son, what I want for your church is this. I want you to preach Jesus. I want you to magnify his name. I want you to elevate him. Hallelujah. I want you to make sure that the people know how much he loves them and that he died for them and that there's victory at the cross. There's victory in his blood and that the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, can live in them and strengthen them and empower them and that they can take that Holy Spirit in them and they can release that glory in the world out there. And people's lives can be changed. And the music. Oh, man. 
We did it tonight, but we've been doing it. Exalt Jesus. Yes. And I'm telling you right now, the more you get involved in it, the better it's going to get, my friend. One of those songs she was singing, the more I see, I can't sing, y'all know that, but I try. I told, was telling somebody today, I told Joseph Larson the first time he preached for him, I said, I can't do that, bro. He's like, what you talking about? Why not? I said, because I can't sing. But I've been trying. The more I see you, no. <laughs> we'll do it right. How's that sound? Hallelujah. We'll give you the mic. Go ahead and just sing a little acapella there right there. Get it, girl. All right. <laughs> the more I seek you. The more I seek you. The more I find you. The more I find you. real simple because I got to tell you something I didn't always have an intimate relationship with Jesus I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 19 and I was a mess and I'm so glad he saved me okay but I got to tell you I was mediocre at best and I really wasn't even getting that one and it took tragedy for me it doesn't take tragedy though you, we can move towards the Lord it took tragedy for me to be broken and in the midst of my brokenness in the midst of my tragedy I learned something that was so so powerful in the midst of pain, when I had nothing else to look at. See, because my daddy's way of raising me didn't work. Being a Marine and telling me to pick myself up, pull myself up by the bootstraps, don't work when you're fighting the devil, my friend. And when you're trying to learn, even after a Christian, and you're trying to do it in your flesh and in your own strength, it doesn't cut it. But I can tell you right now, when I moved in with a broken heart towards the Lord, and it started in my living room. It started in my living room at 4 o'clock in the morning. One morning after the Lord had been calling me, and I, I don't mean to keep repeating the same stories, but I know that they have people in this place right here, right now, that you might not have in, entered in, and you might not have grabbed a hold of that intimate place, that secret place with the Lord. And I'm telling you, sometimes it just starts with a simple prayer. It can even start Sunday mornings whenever we're praying here, just coming in 10 minutes before service, moving it up to 15 minutes before service, moving it up to 20 minutes before service. I'm just trying to make a point. Sometimes it starts with a whisper. Sometimes it starts, you, you, understand, you understand what I'm saying? But as you move towards intimacy, as you begin to call upon him he begins to draw you his word says it if you draw near me i will draw near you yes. some people are like well i don't know man it makes me feel kind of funny <laughs> you know no it'll make you feel funny all right make you feel like you're full of the holy ghost That's make right. you feel like you're full yeah. of power make you feel like you're getting learning what in 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 your weakness my strength is made perfect Oh, man, I'm telling you, if you hadn't learned how to get intimate, you're missing out. All right? Let's just leave it right there. He says, you know, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. I mean, that just sounds bad when you read it, doesn't it? But then he says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. The NASB version says, says it like this. If the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You know, salt that loses its flavor, it loses its purpose. Uh, many, a Bible student has pointed out the fact that salt is a preservative. So back in the day, they didn't have refrigeration, they would salt meat, right? So it's a preservative. And, 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 and you know, he's saying that you and I are the salt of the earth. If you have Jesus living on the inside of your heart, that means the Holy Spirit lives in you, amen? And if you got the Holy Spirit living in you, then you're the salt of the earth. Yes. 
If believers lose their saltiness, though, they lose their purpose. Because not only is salt a preservative, but I want you to know this. And also, I don't know, y'all, anybody in here cook? Raise your hand if you cook. Just go ahead. Yeah. Praise God. I, I've tried to cook. I, I mean, I can actually cook pretty decent, I think. At least people have told me that I can. I've, I've messed around. Actually, I've been cooking since I was like 12 years old. Mom will tell you that. I'm not going to tell you my first dish. But what salt does, it's kind of different than other seasonings, at least in my opinion. And I've said this before, and you might remember it, but salt has this way of revealing hidden flavors within food. You ever notice that? I mean, when we first got married, I started learning my mother-in-law is Sicilian, and I really had never tapped into that stuff before. And then now we got olive oil and we got garlic, and I'm like, okay. And I'm expressing that garlic in there. I think I told you all this story. And I and I eat. I don't taste the garlic. And then I keep doing it. Now you finally said, "Did you put salt in there? Sprinkle a little salt." I was like, "Whoa! There was so much garlic in there, but I didn't even know it because I didn't have enough salt in it. I didn't salt my pasta. And so before, when I hit that, hit it with that salt." And I've, I've noticed the same thing with, with gumbos and other things like that. When I add salt, it's like all of a sudden all those hidden flavors come. See, you got Jesus on the inside of you. Jesus is on this earth. You're the salt of the earth. And Jesus is being hidden if we keep our salt, like somebody said recently, in the salt shaker. And we don't let it out. Hallelujah. We need to let the Jesus out so that Jesus can be revealed. Amen. Because he's the flavor that people need. He is what people need. Amen. Praise God, but it's also a preservative. Man, this world is so messed up. I mean, listen, we think about this too. Uh, you know, what, what in the world would happen? What's going to happen when the Christians are gone? There's only going to be one more. There's only going to be one more reason for human beings to continue to live, and that's for Israel. Once the church is gone, whatever your timing is, there's nothing left other than for Israel to come in. You understand? Because in reality, if the, if the Christians weren't here, see, because I'm starting to realize this more than ever before. I'm not saying God never does anything on his own, but he has willed it to be this way that he will work through human beings. He wants to work through you. He wants to work through you, Mr. Gowdy. He wants to work through you, Pamela. He wants a vessel. He wants a physical vessel because we're living on a physical earth. And he wants to fill this vessel with his spirit. And he wants to release his spirit. That video that you sent me about intercession. Oh, man. It was just so well put that, that the Lord is looking for a vessel that he can fill with the spirit. And he can release. And he can commune with. Amen. And, and he can move upon our heart. And that we can pray his will. And when we begin to pray his will and take authority over the works of the enemy. Because see, the enemy wants to have his, he has his own plan for this earth. And God is looking for you and I now, what we lost in Adam, we've gained back in Christ, amen. We've gained back our power and our authority through the cross, through what Jesus did at the cross, amen. And now he's ready for us to rise up, amen. He's ready for us to rise up and to do the will and the work of God. Now I put it in, what, 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 if Christians don't expose Jesus, what purpose do they have? When we let our light shine before men, they see our works and it glorifies the Father. So one of the first things that I got to figure out, Danielle, you can put this scripture up just so they can see it with their own eyes. John 6, 28. First thing we need to figure out is what is the work of God? Because Jesus said it. He said, when we, he said, let, you know, let, let your work do your works before that they might see your works. That they might see your works and it might glorify your Father in heaven. So then, so, Je so then they asked Jesus. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And look what he says. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he sent. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he sent. Now, if we get that right, 
If we really, really, really get that right, and we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in our heart, I'm telling you right now, we're going to be the workingest kind of people that you ever want to see. We'll be doing all kind of works for the Lord because our motives will be right. The way you don't want to work is you don't want to just get stuck in a church, especially this church. Please don't get stuck in this church just going through the routines of doing work or doing works, although we do need people to do works. Hallelujah. Okay, but we don't get stuck doing works and you're not you're not continuing to grow in your faith. You're not continuing to be intimate with the Lord. You're not continuing to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your heart because then we're missing the whole point and we become frustrated. We become frustrated because we don't feel like we're being recognized. We don't feel like we're being appreciated. And that's listen, the devil wants nothing more than to help you feel that. Can I tell you that? I'm promising you that right now. How you know so much, preacher? <laughs> Trust me. I've been serving the Lord for a little while now, and I've been involved in ministry and churches, and I've seen the enemy sneak in there and come try to lay those serpent eggs up in my head to try to make me get frustrated and aggravated, and they don't even appreciate me. And sometimes you, you might feel like people don't appreciate you. But I can tell you one thing. I sure try to, to let people know. How much I appreciate it. I might do my best. Anyway, praise God. I've heard doctors say this before. We do God's work, you know, because I'm a nurse practitioner too. I'm like, hey man, what you, what, what, how you been doing? Yeah. Doing God's work. No. No, you don't. Because when people do God's work, God gets the glory, not That's man. Right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Jesus speaks to the Pharisees. He says, Therefore, all that they do, they tell you, do it and, and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and they do not do them. And then he says in verse, that's Matthew 23, but in verse 5 he says, but they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. Now, I kind of want to close this session with this concept here. It comes out of Mark. I'm just going to read it to you. It says, while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, interesting that we chose our songs tonight the way we, the way y'all chose them, because I didn't help you, right? The Holy Spirit did. He's helping us. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Reclining at the table, there came a woman, John says it's Mary, Lazarus' sister, came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and she poured it all over his head. And now, scholars say that this was about a year's worth of wage. And most people believe she was saving it probably for her marriage, her marriage day, because that was a big deal. In that time, I mean, it's still a big deal, but, but, but the idea is that she was saving it for that very special occasion, we would think, because that we can see that this is a common thing that took place at that time, okay? But some were indignant, remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? As a matter of fact, one of the Gospels tells us that was Judas that did that, right? And, and, and Jesus says, you have the poor with you always. She poured this ointment on my body. She did it for my burial. Verily I say, wheresoever this gospel is preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman has done be told for a memorial of her. Wow. She made the cut, my friend. She made her works ended up in the scripture of memorials of remembrance. Somebody gave all they had. I think about this woman. I don't know about you, but I try to put I try to put my 3D glasses on and try to watch this thing play out. I mean, wow. She had to push through. You get that? This house was probably filled with people. Uh, the rabbis here. <laughs> the rabbis eating at Simon's house, right? And 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 and, and, and just packed out full of people. And, and it says she had to push through the embarrassment. I mean, have you ever, look, I don't know about you, but even sometimes coming to the altar is a big deal, right? I mean, do y'all ever felt that? It's not as big of a deal for me now, but it used to be. Praise God, the more you do it, the easier it gets. <laughs> but, but, but I'm telling you, there was a time that I, I'm like, I ain't going to that altar. People that go to that altar, they, they, something ain't right with them, they, or they weird, or they go to the altar too much, and you know, whatever, I don't know. But, but, but she pushed through the embarrassment. She pushed through all the critical spirits. Yeah. 
There was that other woman too that put that washed his feet and put the oil on his feet and washed it with her tears and her hair. Yes. And you remember what they said about her, right? They said, oh, what kind of prophet is this? <laughs> and you know what kind of woman that was? Touching him. That's a sinful woman. Oh. And, and he's over there letting her just wash his feet with her tears and her hair. Jesus, Jesus cuts right through to avoid what? Oh, man, I'd love to flow in the gifts like that. I might not use it right there, Lord. <laughs> Lord, no, help me. Help me to get right. He said, he comes right through. He says, to them that love much, to them that are forgiven much, they love much. See, if you have been a mess in your life in the past, instead of letting the devil condemn you and put a weight and a burden on you, you need to see how Jesus felt about that woman that lavished him with her love. And you need to understand, he'll take care of the religious hypocrites. You just pour your love out on him and you learn how to be intimate with him and you and him are going to be really, really close. Amen? Amen. You know, I was thinking she pushed through, she poured all that she held out in pure worship. And, and I was thinking real quick about Paul in the Corinthian church. I'm not going to get into it too much, but you remember communion. And he said, you're not discerning the Lord's body rightly. Because you remember what they were doing. They were coming together and they were drinking the drink. They were eating the bread. And then the poor folk come later and, oh, sorry, we ran out. And, and Paul's like, you're not discerning the Lord's body rightly. What are you doing? You're selfish. You're eating all this stuff. You don't even care about other. We can still do that in the church today. I mean, nobody's going to sit back there and eat them little wafer things. But our mindset can be wrong. Our ideas about other people and, and that they kind of get on our nerves and we don't care enough. But no, 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 that's not okay. And it's not acceptable in the house of God. In the house of God, we need to let the Holy Spirit deal with our hearts. We need to let the Holy Spirit deal with our hearts. We need to get off our high horse and we need to let God do something in us so that we can learn how to love the way that Jesus loved us. What would he, what would have happened to us had he treated us the way sometimes that we have treated others? Lord, help us. We got to treat the Lord's body rightly. And, and, and she did. She discerned his body. Amen. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. She discerned his body rightly. She was a reminder to a room filled with disciples that the heart, oh, I'll put it right here in the notes, Mike, that the heart of true worship is all about him. Yes. Judas complained about the woman's extravagant worship and stated that the product could have been sold to feed the poor. And I put him on, you don't want to feed the poor, Judas. <laughs> the Bible already told us he was pitching. You were stealing from the bag, man. <laughs> you're, you're over here. You see, you're acting like your motives are justified. You're acting like you're all self-righteous, but you got sin in your heart. And many times the way that we respond in certain situations is because something's not right with us and we need to get our heart right. Amen. And then there's her and her simple faith. She believed on the one whom God sent and it changed her. It changed her so much that she pushed through the stairs she pushed through the, the cares. <laughs> she pushed through the stairs and she pushed through the cares because she was likely saving this for her wedding and it was a whole year's wage. She just laid it all out. Man. She laid it all out. She gave Jesus her life. I, that's how I've been talking lately to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, I'm going to leave it all on the field. So my daddy tried to tell me about a little bit about football. Leave it on the field, boy. Football is nothing to me. I want to leave it on the field of life for Jesus. That's what that's what I want to do with my life. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. Let's stand up and listen. I want to encourage you. If you, if, this is a perfect opportunity right here to get intimate with the Lord, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Praise God.